Praise the Lord. All right. So, uh, continuing, uh, continuing from uh, the scriptures that we've been starting over the last two weeks, we're making our journey through John chapter 4, uh, the woman at the well. And Phil has read 7 to 15 today. And we're reading this and we're going through this in order to be able to, as I said right at the beginning, to wring the neck out of this scripture, to squeeze every juice out of it. And, uh, you know, as I look through it, I just think you know, we could go on for, for, for weeks and weeks and months, really, uh, because there's so much in there. So here we go. Uh, I left it last week uh, by saying, uh, for the woman uh, coming to the well and drawing water was her daily routine. And life is filled with daily routines, just the everyday reality of life. And we asked the question, where can we find God in the everyday reality of life? I mean, we want these experiences where we just touch heaven and we have these incredible emotional encounters and we, we are filled with this uh, intellectual revelation. But what God wants to do is meet us in the reality of the ordinary. And here this woman has come to the well to draw water on an ordinary day in order that she might be sustained. It's, her part, it's part of her routine. But there was nothing routine about this day, this day that she was about to encounter Jesus. We need to know it's in the ordinariness of life that God's, God meets us. I was watching TV the other day, watching football, and Tottenham were losing terribly on Wednesday. And uh, all first half, I was just churning inside. I was feeling irritated. I was saying irritating things as Liverpool just go after goal. We were just beating, uh, beating. And, then, and I was feeling frustrated and uh, thinking things, saying things I shouldn't say, but I was saying. And then during the, the half time, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said to me, this is not who you are now. And, uh, and I said, you're right. And, and so all the second half, I spent speaking in tongues under my breath as we, as we, just to retain myself from saying things that I shouldn't say and feeling things I shouldn't feel. But God met me in that moment and there was a breakthrough for me in regards to being an overcomer. So we mustn't lose out on the blessing in the ordinary because we're looking to meet with God in the spectacular. Oh, God will meet us in the spectacular. But life is basically very ordinary. And if you want to meet with God constantly, you have to be susceptible to his presence in the ordinary-ness of life every day. So I was um, out with a friend of mine who's a teacher in one of the schools. And I've been praying for a couple of years now for most of the people that are the teachers and a few staff. And, and, I, and of course, you've lost touch over the last two years or so, lost a bit of touch. And it was great to connect with this guy. And he began to share with me some of the lives of the people that I've been praying for. And I have had no news about where they are. And yet, as this guy began to teach, he began to share with me the news about their lives. I began to see the hand of God in their lives, moving them, doing things. And it was such an encouragement to me to listen to his testimony about the people that I've been praying for for the last years and years. So don't lose out on the spectacular because it's in the silence. It's in the, it's got, God is working in the background. God is working in the ordinariness, working in the space between this and this. There's a space time. And in that space time, God is working. You cannot see it, that Waymaker song. You cannot see it even when I don't see that you're working. God is working. And God was about to encounter this woman through Jesus in a way that she had never, ever perceived before. But she was in danger of missing it because she was looking for something in the spectacular when it was happening to her in the ordinariness of life. So, The disciples were with Jesus and they left him and he makes his way to this well. 
And we have to ask the question, where were they? Well, apparently they were out shopping. The disciples had left Jesus to go and do some shopping. Well, at least that was their excuse. Now, I, I'm a husband, I'm a man, I don't like shopping, I never have. Uh, but, um, and if I can avoid it, I will. Um, and, uh, but, uh, so these disciples had gone shopping. Now, that's not their first choice. A football match, maybe, but not shopping. And yet they weren't there with Jesus on that occasion as he made his way up to Samaria in order to be able to connect to the people there. And we've said before at the beginning that the Samaritans and the Jews, they did not get on. They were not very close cousins. And I wonder, was uh, the disciples not there because they didn't fancy visiting their cousins? They didn't want to go and see the people that they didn't like. And so they avoided it, even sacrificing themselves to go shopping in order to not connect to the people that God wanted them to connect to. I don't know. I'm reading into it a little bit. Why was Jesus left alone? Well, sometimes there are things that God wants to do in us and through us that can only be done when we're on our own, when we're alone. And it's in the space time of that distance that represents God's encounter into our lives. But if you are not aware of it, you will be most likely to miss it. And many lessons have not been learned through the trials and the tribulations of life because we have been looking for something when the something that we should have been looking for was in the space-time of our experience. So be mindful, be sensitive, and take every opportunity that life gives you in order to glean from God and his encounter with you. Would Jesus have spoken to this woman had the disciples been there? Probably not. Probably not. And the reason for that is because sometimes we can overwhelm people. I mean, Christians have done that for years. We can, you know, someone new comes into church and we just all pounce on them, you know, and uh, we all, you know, drive them away uh, instead of allowing them just to be, rather than to make them feel like they are kind of, uh, you know, the, the fairy on the, on the, on the wedding cake. Oh, no, it's not fairy, is it? Well, anyway, it's a, it's a couple on the fairy cake. No, anyway, you got it. But it's, it's they don't want to be the centre of it. And, and here... Here, um, sometimes, Jesus has to deal with us while we're on earth. And so the disciples were not there, and Jesus confronts this woman and encounters this woman and begins to engage in conversation with this woman because he didn't want her to be overwhelmed. Did the disciples want some time out? I've been on mission, I've been on mission all over the world in different places, and sometimes you can get tired out when you're on mission. It wears you out day after day, week after week, just giving the same thing. It can be very tiring. Did they just want to escape and have some me time? I said last week that the Sabbath was given in order for us to rest. And it's really important that we learn to rest and find a rest Sabbath every week. Otherwise, our bodies won't recover. But it's also true to say there are six days to work. Yeah? And look what God did in six days. And it's true to say that me time, okay, is for the Sabbath. Yeah, with God. You get one day to recover. And there are six days to serve. Six days to be proactive. If you fill your life with me time... And so all of your life consists of meism, it's the world according to me, then you're going to lose sight of what God has called you to and what God has saved you from. God wants you to give your life to him in order for you to live life in all of its fullness. And the only way you're going to be able to do that, Jesus said, is if you Less a grain of mustard seed fall into the ground and die. He cannot bear fruit. If you want your life to be transformed, then you need to trust your life, all six days, plus the one, even the rest day, in God's hands. Let God use your life to be a fragrance to the world so that the world can be transformed 
through you, that the people who heard you can be transformed because of you and the Spirit of God that lives in you. Lest you find yourself focusing only on me time and lose sight of what life is meant for you now that you have been saved. There are dangers of talking to a woman. That's true, isn't it? There are dangers in talking to a woman, talking to a man. There's dangers in ministry in talking to women and talking to men. You know, many a shipwreck has occurred as a result of men and women in ministry and in life just spending time talking, listening to one another, being drawn into inappropriate relationships. In the 80s, I remember someone saying that people who go to therapy are likely, likely to have an affair with their therapist because they listen to one another and as a result of that, they find themselves trapped in a deep relationship. There are dangers in ministry. And right from the very beginning as a pastor, we were safeguarded by those before us who instructed us to be wise and be diligent in regards to how you manage that whole experience. There are dangers in talking to women and men alone because compassion for that person can be mistaken for interest and interest for that person can be mistaken for intimacy. So there has to be wisdom applied. She said to Jesus, acting within the protocol, as he approached her, woman, give me a drink. She said to Jesus, how is it that you being a Jew, ask me, a woman, for a drink? A Samaritan woman of that. A Jewish man would not connect to a Jewish woman and a Jewish man would definitely not connect to a Jewish Samaritan woman. And here Jesus is breaking the protocol and speaking to this woman when it was out of the expectation of the social realm that they both lived in. She is highlighting the rejection and the tension that she feels within her heart regarding the two cultures. She is reflecting on the relationship that the Jewish nation was actually having with the Samaritan people. She says, I am a Samaritan. and Within Jewish eyes, I am seen as less than you. I am a woman. And you are a man. In the eyes of the world, I am seen as less than you. Because that was the perception of the day. But we need to know as Christians that God has made us who we are. And the physiological reality of our identity is represented in what you look like. So however you was born in terms of your physiological reality... It's who you are. It's who you are. And we need to value the gender that we represent. If we are a man or if we are a woman, then we need to celebrate the reality of our identity. Now, in this culture, there was big issues. Life has changed somewhat since then. But there is an extremity to over-focus on trying to compensate for thousands of years of inappropriateness by overcoming we have the intensity of the gender rising up against the other gender. And there is an imbalance in this thing. And everything is chaotic. And everything is in a spin and a twist. We need to celebrate the reality of our gender, whether we are a man or whether we are a woman. We need to value our gender. We need to accept and experience the reality of our identity within our gender. Man has qualities that are unique to man. And women have qualities that are unique to woman. They're not less than each other. They're not more than each other. They are valued in the reality of their identity as men and women. So is who I am then determined by what my body 
is. What is natural to nature? In nature, your body represents your gender. So what then, in these days, is in conflict? Well, there is an incredible intensity of conflict in these days at this present time. Now the conflict, brothers and sisters, is not with your body. The conflict is within your soul. The conflict of identity regarding the gender is because we have messed up souls. Our mind, our emotions and our will are in conflict because something about who we are has been lost and that something is who we are inside of who we are. The Bible says we are spiritual beings. We have souls and we live in bodies, which means inside of each human being is a spirit. Now, that spiritual reality of who we are has gone to sleep. But when you become a Christian, that reality comes alive. That's what born again means. We are spiritually reborn. Now, when our spirits are reborn, we begin to understand who we really are. And what God does is invest in our spirit, his Holy Spirit, teaching us his holy ways so that we can take back control over our soul, which is in chaos, our mind, our emotions and our will. And God uses our spirits to renew our souls so that we begin to think the way we should have thought in the beginning before sin entered the world and life went into chaos. But through Jesus, we can have stability in our thinking, stability in our emotions, and stability in our will, in the things that we do. And so we can have peace and not turmoil. Who am I? I am a spiritual being. I have a soul and I live in a body. Now this woman is operated in the natural. She is not expecting. She's just come to the water jar, come to the water well to draw water. It's an ordinary day. She's not expecting Jesus to turn up. She is not expecting to go on a spiritual journey with a complete stranger, a Jewish stranger at that, talking inappropriately to a woman, a Samaritan woman. She is not expecting to encounter a truth journey or a glory revelation from heaven. She's just there to fetch water. The only concern she has is to fetch water. But Jesus on this occasion and on this day has got other things in store for this woman. So don't miss out on the revelations from God because it comes to you in an ordinary way on an ordinary day. He says to her, if you knew the gift of God, the gift of God, if you knew the gift of God. Now, the gift of God is the Word of God. The Word of God is the gift of God. And Jesus said of himself, I am the Word. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word, Jesus, was with God. He was with God in the beginning. In him, the Word, all things were made. Without the word, nothing was made that was made. He was with God in the beginning. Jesus was there right in the beginning. When God said whatever he said, Jesus was in that moment. And the gift of God is the word of God because the word brought life to humanity. Moses was given the law by God for the Jews. It was the bread to feed them spiritually. The law was the word to bring them to God 
and to sustain them in their fellowship with God. Jesus replies to the woman's question, reveals to us something unique about how we enter into conversations with people, how we communicate people. He says to her, if you knew the gift of God. She doesn't know what he's talking about. He who asks the question controls the conversation. And in life, you're going to have many conversations with people you don't really know, as well as people you do know. And it, God has got you there in order to share your experience of him with them. Now, sometimes you use words and sometimes you use actions. But the reality of your encounter that you are having with God, God is wanting you on the six days that you're at work to reveal him to them. That's your purpose. That's what you're there. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. John in Matthew says, no one puts a lamp under the table, but he puts it on the lampstand where it gives light to the whole world. The reality of who you are, the light of God in you, is supposed to be making an impact in the lives of the people around you. So that your light impacts them and shows them the reality of God's love for them through you. He who asks the question controls the conversation. So in Mark 12, 14, 17 says this. They came and said to him, Teacher, we know that you are truthful. They're buttering it up. And do not care what other people think. For you are not partial to anyone. But you teach the ways of God in truth. So they've come to appreciate. So they ask him a question. Is it permissible to pay poll tax to Caesar? Yes or no? And Jesus' response to them is this. Are we to, today, are we to pay poll tax? Jesus says to them, why are you testing me? Bring me a denar to look at. So they bring him a denar and he shows them, the, they show him a denar. And he brought one of them and he said to them, whose image is on this? He asked them a question in response to their question. Whose image? And they said, Caesar's. And Jesus goes on to say, then give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God. Jesus was able to control the conversation because he was able to transfer the question they asked him and declare another question in response to his question. So if you're struggling to be a witness to people, when people ask you a question, Ask them a question back so that you determine where the conversation is going to go. I was standing at the door the other day of someone in the church and the postman came along and he delivered his letter and we were just talking and I said to the postman, the Lord's got a letter in that parcel for you. And he looked a bit blunt and walked away. <laughs> Look... <laughs> We need to look to the circumstances around us and take advantage of the opportunities that are before us, lest we find ourselves not impacting the lives of the people. I asked you two weeks ago, do you witness? Do you share the love of God with people, both in terms of your life and your service and your words? Do you do that? Well, there's a whole world out there that's waiting to see the reality of God's love. And unless they see it through you, they're not going to see it. I never come into your world, so I can't ask your postman whether he's got a letter. But you can. You can. And you can do it. And you can give your neighbour food. And you can go and visit a friend, perhaps at the moment, but you can go and visit a friend. And you can go and be there for them if they're hungry. And you can go and feed the poor. And you can go and give funds to a need and you can go and serve and push someone's car. You can go and demonstrate it, all of those things. That's what you can do. I can't do your world, but you can do in your world what I can't do for you. And God wants to motivate an army, Christians, to be a representation of him, just like Jesus gave us an example in this encounter with this woman on an ordinary day in an ordinary situation. Jesus tells 
sorry, in John, uh, Jesus tells us this. He says, I am the real bread that came down from heaven. I am the gift of God. Moses was given the law, but Jesus says to the Jews, I am the gift. I am the gift of God. The true gift of God that came down from heaven. So if you want to know what the gift of God is, that you're supposed to be given away to others, it's the gift of God, Jesus. Jesus is the gift of God. Moses had the revelation of the law in Leviticus, but what we have got is the gift of God, Jesus, to give to people. We haven't got anything else. We've got the gift of God, Jesus, which is the word, which is the revelation of the New Testament, the things Jesus said and the things Jesus done and the promises Jesus has made. That's what we've got to give to the world, not the law. Jesus is the living water, the life-giving water. Remember he said to the woman, he goes on next week, I am the life-giving water. And this life-giving water is spiritual food to connect us to God, to bring our spirits alive so that we can then live as children of God who are being transformed in our souls so that we have renewal of our mind, renewal of our emotions, and renewal of our things that we do. And the changes transform, begin to shine a bright light to them, and say to people, there's something different about you. When Jesus is in our lives, Jesus has given us that life-giving water, spiritual food. He is the one that sets the sinful captive free and brings them back to God. He is the one that feeds them spiritual, spiritual bread to sustain them in their relationship with God while they live their lives on the earth. Jesus is the vaccinator for the virus called the sinful nature. Jesus is the vaccinator for the virus that's called the sinful nature. I want you to say it with me. Jesus is the vaccinator <laughs> Jesus is the vaccinator for the virus called sinful nature, which means God has given us Jesus to vaccinate us from the sinful nature which is going on in our soul, our body. And he does that by feeding our spirits to enlighten us to take charge over the way we live our lives. And now my time is gone. And I'm only halfway through this sermon. I've got to be kind to people. Well, come and finish this morning. Let's pray. Praise the Lord. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you, Morning, everybody. Thank, and, and thank you, Paul, and just thinking that uh, we need some supernatural time here, don't we? Somehow we need to, to find a way, or God show us a way to, 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 to have enough time to continue to listen to, to, to Paul and, and, and his word for us this morning. So, Father, we just thank you for, uh, for the truth of your word. And um, as I know, later in that, in that reading, you talk about the uh, you know, worshippers who worship in spirit and in truth are the worshippers that the Father is looking for. And Father, help us to be people who worship in spirit and in truth. Mm-hmm. Father, in, in, as Paul was saying, through the daily routine of our lives, help us to, to find you there in the ordinary. In, in, in those spaces be, be, between, the, in the music we talk about the space between the notes, Lord, that's so much going on in that place. And if we see things in the ordinary, Father, I know that we, that's where we experience the extraordinary with you. And uh, just be with us as, as, kind, as we kind of navigate through the week, through the ups and downs of the week, the things that... Uh, will be great for us and the things that aren't so good. Help us just, just to remember, I, tell you, I want to ask you to help us to remember that we are spiritual beings and we have a soul and we live in a body. 
And uh, th th there's a, an incredible truth to that. And just be with us, each, each and every one of us, Lord, the people here, the people on Zoom, as we go through the week. And um, help us be a blessing, uh, in, as, as just as Jesus was to this woman at the well. Help us be a blessing to the people around us. And I was thinking, I prayed earlier, uh, 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 an expression that I've heard, I can't remember where, but I know somebody it, it gets credited for it, but I, I just know it as... Father, help us preach the gospel at all times. And when necessary, we'll use words. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Well, that's the end of our service. Feel free to, uh, to depart as you will. Uh, you can unmute yourself now on Zoom and just...